Welcome. I'm talking today about church again and about some of the conflicts that are living in the church today and maybe how we ought to be dealing with them, not in terms of what our answer ought to be to each conflict, but in terms of, of how we respond to that. And I've talked about conflict in the last couple of weeks in one way or another. Uh, so, one more time, uh, and the scriptures out of 1 Corinthians. So stay tuned for that. But again, welcome everybody, you, whoever you are, whatever your place in life, whatever your identity, whatever your preferences, whatever your habits, welcome. I'm glad you're here worshiping with us because that's what we're doing, worshiping together. Thanks for joining in. CommunityChurchUMC.org. Support the ministry of Changing Lives for Jesus Christ. Support the ministry of uh, building community right here in North Muskegon and the greater Muskegon area. And doing children's ministry and doing youth ministry and, and doing community ministry. Thanks for being here today. Let's sing together.
Would you pray with me? Oh, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. We pray that you gather us in to the place of prayer, that you put our hearts into the temple, into the Holy of Holies that is already built within us, that you give us space and time to worship you in spirit and truth, to wonder at you, to love you. Lord, we lift up people who are hurting now. There are people getting over surgeries. There are people waiting for surgeries. There are people with COVID. Lord, there are people who are doubting the value of vaccines uh, and, and allowing themselves to get sick. And people are, are again uh, and still sickening and dying. We pray for a country that we live in that is divided in so many ways and pray that we can find ways to be meaningfully united with one another. Holy Spirit of healing, heal our nation, the souls within our nation, and teach us to live in harmony as we may never have done fully. But let us be the people you call us to be, people connected and committed to you. Lord, all of the people grieving, all of the people hurting, all of the people without jobs, all of the people who are struggling uh, to make ends meet, all of the people whose relationships are broken, Lord, where there is hurt, may we bring peace, may we bring help, not empty help, not empty peace, but true peace. And let us discover in that work of peacemaking, of love sharing, may we discover your voice, your guidance for us. And we pray in Jesus' name, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. It's time for the children's message, so I hope you'll join with Wendy and, uh, and step close to the TV or whatever you're watching on and uh, listen up. Good morning, community kids. We're going to jump right into our lesson, so here's what I want you to do. For the next couple seconds, I want you to make as much noise as possible, which I know for some of you is going to be super simple. But as soon as you see me stop making noise, I want you to freeze as well. Are you ready? Let's make some noise. Unfortunately for most of us, silence is really rare. In my house, there's rarely silence. My kids are loud. And if my kids aren't making noise, then my dog is making noise, or my cat is meowing, or the TV is on, or I'm listening to music on my phone. I think most of us have gotten kind of used to having noise around us all the time, that we're not really comfortable with silence. But silence really is a gift. It's a gift to be able to talk to God and listen to God. Jesus knew how very, very important this was, this time of silence. He knew how important it was to our health and our well-being. 
to spend time alone in silence. Not reading a book, not listening to music, but silence. In the book of Mark, chapter 1, verse 35, it says this about Jesus. Very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and went off to a solitary place where he prayed. Jesus knew the value of being alone with his thoughts, alone with the silence, and alone with God. It's something we have to practice. It does not always come easy, but the benefit is so great. I want you to try it this week. Set a timer for just one minute, one minute, all noise off, gone. Spend one minute in silence, and then let me know how you feel after that one minute. Have a great week, guys. Walls mark our boundaries and keep us apart. Walls keep the world from our eyes and our heart. Tables around making room for one more. Welcoming friends we had not known before. So build us a table and tear down the wall. Christ is our host, there is room for us all. Build us a table and tear down the wall. Christ is our host. There is room for us all. Walls make us sure who is in and who's out. Walls keep us safe from all question and doubt. But at a table, Exchange new forms of time as our lives rearrange. So build us a table and tear down the wall. Christ is our host, there is room for us all. Build us a table and tear down the wall. Christ is our host, there is room for us all. Strangers divided alone Hate and distrust built a wall stone by stone Now at the table the bread that we share Joins us to Christ in a circle of care So build us a table and tear down the wall Christ is our host, there is room for the soul There is room for us all To build us a table And tear down the wall Christ is our host There is room for us all Build us a table And tear down the wall Christ is our host There is room for us all There's this wonderful line out of that old hymn, Just As I Am. The line is, fighting's within and fears without. That describes the world that we seem to live in these days. Fighting's within, fears without. And it doesn't matter what kind of within you're talking about. If you're talking about within our nation, there's fighting. If you're talking about within the United Methodist Church, there's fighting. If, there's, if you're talking about our congregation, community, there's fighting. It's pretty civil. But there's disagreement, and it's strong and people share their opinions. And God bless that disagreement. And even in our own souls, in our own being, 
in our own minds. There is fighting. And when we fight with ourselves, we find this. We find ourselves of divided mind. We find ourselves as a church feeling like we don't know what direction we're going. We find ourselves as a nation wandering a little lost, a little without a clue about what we're really supposed to be up to and where our faith, our trust lies. We disagree about things that may be important. We disagree about our priorities. We disagree about how to say things. We disagree about how to think about things. We are fighting within. And then we're fighting without. And you know, one of the things that has really struck me in the last month or two has been that we, the church, are fighting on behalf of God's ideals and God's plans and God's dreams for us against a culture that believes that we are foolish, idealistic, dreamers, people who are trying to do things that aren't realistic, that aren't acceptable, that that are too complicated and too difficult, and so we should just give up and, and let the miserable people be miserable forever, that we should just give up and, and not try to change the world for the better. And yet the United Methodist Church, sure, the United Methodist Church says, we are here to make disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world, not for the leaving it the same. Leaving it all the same is what the world would like to do to itself. And yet the world is busy destroying itself. I mean, the, we're destroying the climate as fast as we can. And we, and we look at the people who would like to make it right and we think, oh, foolish idealists. We look at the people who would like to house the homeless and say, oh, foolish idealists. We look at people who would like to share love with those who are in need, who are hurting, the millions of people in Afghanistan who are going to be starving this winter, and we look at, at how hard it is to make a difference. And we say, no, I'll just stay home, thanks. I'll stay home and I'll just do nice things for myself and I'll look after myself and I'll look after mine and not step out into anything difficult. We have fightings within and fears without. Indeed, the world is filled with fear. And I, think, and I think when the world says we're too idealistic, the world is afraid of failure. The world is afraid of ideals. Because we used to have ideals when we were younger. When we were younger and we could afford to have ideals, when we were younger and we could afford to have beliefs, when we were younger and we could afford to care. And we have had a harder time caring. We have become, maybe as a result of COVID, we have become even more inward focused self-centered, survival-driven, fear-driven. It's time to leave the fear behind. But let me read to you from a Paul's letter, uh, the first letter that he wrote to the Corinthians, the church in Corinth. Chapter 3 got a couple of different sections out of it. I, I could encourage you, and I would encourage you to read the whole chapter. It's all worthwhile, but we're just going to do the first four verses and then jump down to the end of the chapter. Paul says this to the people in Corinth, whom he knows, who are having divisions. And 1 Corinthians is really a study in, in, in division inside the church, fightings 
within. He says, and so, brothers and sisters, I couldn't speak to you as spiritual people, but rather as people of the flesh, as infants in Christ. And now, I want to, I've been hard on you already in this sermon. I've been hard on the world already in this sermon. And so I'll continue in that vein and say, would this be true of you? And it's not true of all of you. But would it be true of you? If Paul were to say to you, you are not ready for serious. You're not ready for demanding. You're not ready for the truth that Jesus is expecting. To hear the truth of what God is really hoping for from you. To hear the full measure of what God is asking of you. To hear the full level of difficulty that following Jesus is going to mean. Are you ready for that? Or are you only interested in taking milk? Yeah, that's hard. We have a three-month-old grandbaby. That grandbaby is still in the milk stage. When he hits about four months, he's ready for some almost solids. And he's a long way from meat, isn't he? They'll start with mashed, you know, what do they call it? Pureed rice and sweet potatoes and stuff like that. Yeah. Is that the, is that the solid food we're up for? Are we up for the solid food of Jesus changing our lives? Of Jesus calling us to a more serious and more deeply committed faith walk. And while this is a hard word from, from Paul that he's giving to these folks in Corinth, I couldn't even speak to you as spiritual people. But he makes clear there's this, there's this progress that you start as an infant in Christ and then you are a person of, as you would say in his, in his language, a person of the flesh. A person thinking about material things, thinking about things that are just here, just now, physical comfort. We are guilty of that, aren't we? I know I am. But then to be spiritual people, that's our aspiration. That's where we get to, we pray. Lord, make me a more spiritual, more real, more complete, more absolutely, profoundly committed person for you. Lord, make me that. And don't let me be some spiritual slacker, a spiritual nothing, a spiritual low commitment person. He says, I fed you with milk, not solid food, for you weren't ready for solid food. Even now, you're still not ready, for you're still of the flesh. Now, Paul is looking at him saying, you're not stepping up the way you're supposed to. You're not advancing the way you're supposed to. You're not growing the way you're supposed to. You're still staying there. And the funny thing is... When he's talking to the church at Corinth, he's talking specifically to a group of people uh, within that church who think that they're more spiritual than everybody else. But he, he even uses that as proof that they're not spiritual. Because if they were truly followers of God, if they were truly living with God's light and life in them, then they would not have to keep pressing this vanity claim, this pride of being more spiritual than the other folks. Because that's what they wanted to do. They wanted to be the spiritual leaders, the spiritual big shots. 
I'm going to be one of those. It is my experience that the most spiritual people are the most open, the most kind, the most loving, the most welcoming, the most humble. And so the spiritually vain are in fact the least spiritual. The people who tell you how often they pray, the people who tell you how often they study the Bible are trying to prove something that basically isn't true. That they're really further along in the spiritual walk than you are. So don't go for that. Don't go for that spiritual vanity. Don't go for trying to prove and you trying to prove how spiritual you are. Be the opposite of that. Be humble followers of Jesus Christ. All right, moving right along. For as long as there is jealousy and quarreling among you, ah, there's the thing. As long as there is jealousy and quarreling among you, are you not of the flesh? and behaving according to human inclinations. Yeah, because all of our pride and all of our division is simply about ourselves and it's not about God. And what comes again and again to be about God is love, is humility, is our own weakness. I'm inclined to tell you about ways that people do this wrong. That some people allow themselves to be abused and think that they are being spiritually strong. No. And some people allow other people to dominate all of their thoughts and opinions so that they have none of their own or they simply keep them quiet. So when there is jealousy and when there is quarreling in our midst, then we know we're getting head up with, with human things. When we're calling all our friends and saying, I want you to stick up for this idea. I want you to talk to leadership and tell them this. And I want you to use your influence on behalf of my idea. When that happens, what are we doing wrong? We are giving in to earthly desires. So what was, what was going on in the church in Corinth? One of the things that was going on was that they had originally gotten their gospel from Paul. And Paul showed up and he shared the gospel with them, got the first group of Christians together in Corinth. We don't know how many, 10, 15. And then in time, another guy came along whose name was Apollos. And Apollos sort of led that church as well. And he, when Paul had moved on to somewhere else, and Apollos kind of took over and became a leader on his own. And that was great. He grew the church. He moved it forward. And that was his job and his calling and his place in that story. But here's where it went wrong. Is that people thought to themselves and said to one another, Well, I'm a follower of the original Paul. And what he said was this. And so it was right. And someone else would say, yeah, but you know, uh, uh, Apollos is really the authority who's, been, who's led us more recently, and I want to follow his teaching more detailed, and I, and I want to go there. And that's how we ought to be. And so they started being factions within the church, fightings within, right there in Corinth, in the church. People who followed Apollos, people who followed Paul, and they start fighting each other. It is inevitable in the life of church that people fight each other. And here, 
the followers of Paulus and of the followers of Paul who were, who were both missing the point because they were not taking spiritual authority for themselves. They were instead busy being followers of an individual, a human, a person. For when one says, I belong to Paul, and another, I belong to Apollos, are you not merely human? You're still putting a name on it. Why don't you just say, instead of saying I'm a Methodist, or I'm a Lutheran, or I'm a, I'm a good news Methodist, or I'm a you know, an open and affirming Methodist, or I'm a this Methodist, or I'm a this Presbyterian, or this whatever you are. Instead of saying that, how about saying I'm a follower of, oh, what's his name again? Jesus. Because that's what it's all about. And in following Jesus, I am following the will of God because Jesus teaches us the will of God and gives us the word of God. How about that instead? That would be better. So, he says, let no one boast of human leaders, for all things are yours, whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas or the world or life or death or the present or the future, all belong to you. You are over all of this. You are above all of this. You are above these distinctions between people. You are better than this. You are better than the distinction that you are make too much of between conservative and progressive, between Democrat and Republican. The difference between one generation and another generation and another generation. These divisions between people, all of them are ridiculously human. They are, in fact, just plain old ridiculous. All the divisions between humans are divisions that we make that distract us from following God in spirit and in truth. And you belong to Christ, and Christ belongs to God. You got that? Not your other identity. That doesn't matter. Not your other markers. Not your other labels that you choose for yourself or don't choose for yourself. None of these makes a lick of difference. Not even the label American. Not the label went to University of Michigan. I didn't. Not the label that anyone puts on you, but the label of Christ. That I belong to Christ. That I am his all the time. And Christ belongs to God. May God remind you, remind me, every day that our belonging is not to any of these earthly causes or identities that we've invented, that our belonging is instead to Christ Jesus, our Lord and Savior that there is all our hope and purpose and there is our promise not anywhere else. And may God bless you. Build your kingdom here Let the darkness fear Show your mighty hand Heal our streets and land Set your church
Friends, may the love of God and the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you and keep you. May the Spirit of God fill you with purpose and direction and holiness now and forever. Amen.